it was almost two thirds of the, uh, the co-capital of Russia was burnt down by the Russians. And yet he was also able to write the rules of the girls' school that he wanted to set up in Saint-Denis, just outside Paris. A few years earlier, uh, when he was moving his entire army from Boulogne, uh, where it was uh, poised to invade Britain, <coughs> all the way across Europe to uh, the battlefield of Austerlitz in the Czech Republic, he could also write to Pierre Forfait, the um, prefect of Genoa, uh, to tell him to stop taking his mistress to the opera. This was a man who was able to compartmentalize his mind. And he was a, uh, in the course of writing this, uh, this book, um, which was universally praised as being beautifully written and wonderfully researched, I paraphrase, um, um, uh, it was nonetheless pointed out by almost all the British reviewers, at least, that Napoleon was the equivalent of um, Saddam Hussein or um, Colonel Gaddafi. Some of them equated him even to Silvio Berlusconi. Uh, completely absurd. Not necessarily in Silvio Berlusconi's uh, account, only to the fact that he had no fewer than 22 mistresses. Um, but other than that, which also, of course, took a certain amount of compartmentalization of his mind, but other than that, he had absolutely nothing in common with these uh, evil dictators, these monsters, let alone the Second World War dictators like uh, Adolf Hitler. He was a builder, a creator. When he came to power in the Brumaire coup in November 1799, he, had, uh, he came to power in a France that had no fewer than 46 different legal codes. And he brought them all down into one, the Code Napoleon. He created the modern French education system with its Grand École and its Lycée and the Sorbonne. He had a, uh, created the Banque de France, of course, the Légion d'honneur. Um, uh, when you go on your romantic weekend to Paris, you will cross one of the four bridges that he um, built. You'll go along the, uh, the two and a half miles of quay, uh, quays that he had, such as the Quai d'Orsay. Uh, this man actually was a, uh, was a creator. Um, and what he did was to keep the best bits of the French Revolution equality before the law, religious toleration, meritocracy, ideas uh, that, uh, that enthused France so much. Uh, the idea that your rank and status in society didn't depend on who your father and grandfather were, but in fact uh, came from your own efforts. This enormously enthused the, uh, the society of the time. And he got rid of the absurd regulations, the things that had hold, held France back, and the, the, the ghastly mistakes that were made in the French Revolution, such as the, um, the Reign of Terror, of course, and uh, the 10-day working week, and uh, the cult of the supreme being. So what he did was to, to keep the best uh, and to discard the worst. And there are so many myths about this man, which in the course of the research for my book, I, uh, I came across again and again, things which are just simply not true. It's not true, for example, that he was a midget. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, he was precisely my height. Uh, which is a thank you. I think was so, this wasn't it, but nonetheless. He was a, um, uh, the reason we think of him as a dwarf was because of the caricatures, this brilliant Brit British caricaturists of the day, uh, men like Thomas Robinson and George uh, Cruikshank and James Gilray. They were making him out to be tiny, but when I went with uh, David Barry, who I'm very pleased to see is, uh, is here, to the island of St. Helena in order to film a BBC TV series um, to, uh, to actually went to his house, Longwood, on uh, St. Helena, a place you can only get to through uh, six days on a, on a boat from Cape Town. Um, and, uh, and when nobody was looking and uh, David had sweetly uh, switched the, uh, the camera off, uh, I lay down on his deathbed. Uh, and I was exactly the right height. Uh, so, uh, so I know how, uh, how, um, how tall this man was, and he wasn't the midget made out uh, by British propagandists. He actually also, unlike people like Adolf Hitler, who never made a funny joke in their lives, had the most fabulous sense of humor. And Napoleon was, uh, in my book, I have at least 80 Napoleon gags. Uh, he could, the reason that the, everybody loved being part of his entourage was that he was just such a funny man. When a, a, an escaped <laughs> lunatic came up to him at the uh, opera and told him that he was in love with the Emperor Josephine, uh, he replied, you seem to have made a curious choice of confidant. 
<laughs> the, uh, there's another moment where um, the Cardinal Archbishop of Paris uh, wrote an incredibly oleaginous letter sucking up to him and, uh, and uh, saying, do you wish he had the opportunity to die for the Emperor? Very unlikely thing that that was ever going to happen considering the Japanese Cardinal Archbishop of Paris. And Napoleon wrote in the top right-hand corner, please pay 12,000 francs uh, to the Cardinal Archbishop out of the theatrical fund. <laughs> um, and yet, you see, we constantly see him as being, uh, as being a monster and a warmonger. It's quite right, of course. He did start the Peninsular War against uh, Portugal in 1807 and Spain in 1808, and, of course, the War of 1812 against Russia. However, there were seven wars of the coalition in the course of the Napoleonic Wars between 1793 and the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, and he caused two of them. The other five were unleashed on France by the uh, reactionary aristocracies and, uh, and monarchies of Austria and Prussia and Russia. And, uh, and of course, we in Britain also kept uh, fighting him all the way through from 1802 to 1815. The disaster, of course, that overcame him was that of Russia, when he went in uh, with an army of 615,000 men um, and crossed the border on the 22nd of uh, June, 1812. And this has always been put down by historians as being an appalling act of hubris, uh, as uh, Nemesis falling upon uh, hubris in the classic ancient Greek dramatic trick. It was nothing like that, ladies and gentlemen. There is such a thing as Napoleon complex, uh, but Napoleon didn't have one. Uh, it was instead a perfectly rational and logical thing to do. He had beaten the Russians twice before, in the Auschwitz campaign and the Friedland campaign. He had an army over twice the size of the Russian army. It was, um, uh, it was as I say, 615,000. It was the same size as the um, population of Paris at the time. Uh, and he wasn't to know that some 100,000 of his men were going to die of typhus, an absolutely disgusting disease in which a uh, louse first defecates and then dies inside your body. And, um, he, did, he had no idea. This uh, was a disease that wasn't diagnosed until 1911, nearly a century later. Uh, he also wanted to stop the army. Uh, he never wanted to go to Moscow. He wanted to fight a battle against the Russians some 20 or so miles into the uh, Russian border uh, over a three-week campaign. He had no plans whatsoever to go all the way to, uh, to Moscow. But he was drawn in more and more. Um, and he knew perfectly well about the Russian Winter. He was a highly educated and intelligent man. He read Voltaire's Life of Charles XII on that campaign. And so uh, he left enough time, almost exactly the same amount of time, to get from Moscow to Smolensk as it had taken him to get from Smolensk to Moscow. And so this was a... Um, uh, the, the problem was, after the Battle of Malayero Slavitz on the 24th of October 1812, um, where, when you go to uh, the battlefields of Malayaroslavets, as David will uh, I'm sure back me up, um, you can see the bullet holes and the shell holes in the uh, only building that survived of the whole town, which was the convent there. Uh, every other building in the town was made of wood and it, all, uh, and it all burnt down. But it was the morning after that battle that Napoleon took the decision to take the long dog leg back via the battlefield of Borodino. Um, and, uh, and that was when the disaster struck, the appalling, ironous, bosh um, things that happened, the catastrophes, the cannibalism, the crossing of the Berezina and so on. So that was what uh, was the problem. He made one mistake out of a campaign of thousands which led, of course, on to the, uh, to the Waterloo campaign three years later. Extraordinary uh, battle. Again, major mistakes that he made. He had the personnel that was wrong. He, his greatest marshal, Marshal Davu, he should have had uh, with him on the battlefield as battlefield commander instead of Marshal May. Instead, he had him back as Par in Paris as governor of Paris and in charge of the National Guard and Minister of the Interior. So um, that was one of his great mistakes. Another uh, was to have split his army two days before the battle and sent the Prussians, sent off um, 33,000 men and 93 guns off to engage the Prussians. Um, and the Prussians took what uh, was uh, clearly the most counterintuitive 
decision of the 19th century, uh, Wellington thought it the most important decision of the 19th century, which was instead of to do what defeated armies always used to do in the early 19th century, which was to go back on, uh, along their own lines of communication, and go back towards where their reinforcements and supplies and ammunition was coming from, instead the decision was taken uh, by von Neisenauer, the uh, Prussian chief of staff, to go north and to uh, stay in touch with Wellington's army, which had allowed the Prussians at four o'clock in the afternoon on the Battle of Bourclou uh, on Sunday the 18th of June, 1815, to stave in, to smash through the, um, uh, the, the French right wing. And, uh, and Napoleon himself was a great one. One of the reasons he won so many battles, he won 47 of his 60 battles. In the course of researching this book, I visited 53 of Napoleon's uh, battlefields. And you see again and again the coup d'oeil that he had when he went to a battlefield. When you go to a battlefield, you can see what he saw. And, uh, and so often um, it was a, a stroke, single stroke of genius that allowed him to win the battle. When you go to Toulon, you see the way in which he was able to capture the Eaglet fortress and the promontory just above the outer harbour, and therefore to fire heated cannonballs down on the Royal Navy in the, uh, in the harbour below. When you visit the um, battlefield of uh, Mount Tabor in Israel, you're able to see the way in which he managed to get his entire army around the back of the Turkish army, the manoeuvre sur le derrière, uh, his, his favourite military manoeuvre, and uh, hide his army in the undulations of the Vale of Jezail and then attack uh, the Turks from behind. And when you um, go to Austerlitz, his greatest victory, uh, which as I say is in the, in the Czech Republic, there too you can see the way in which he hid his, um, his force of, uh, under Marshal Soult, an entire army corps, 10,000 men, in this valley, uh, completely covered by mist. And then at the key psychological moment, at 9.15 in the morning, as the mist was being burnt off by the son of Austerlitz, uh, a vital part of the Bonapartist myth, uh, he then smashed through, he sent them up the Prats and Heights to smash through the Austro-Hungarian um, and uh, Russian centre. And, uh, and, and break through and win the greatest of all of his, uh, all of his victories. So in the course uh, of, the, uh, of the study of all of this, um, I came across so many myths about, uh, about uh, Napoleon, so many things that simply weren't true. And one of the key ones uh, was his relationship with Josephine. Again and again, he is presented, uh, this story is presented as a sort of Romeo and Juliet love story. It was anything but. It was much more adult, much more interesting, much more complicated than that. Yes, he had this extraordinary erotic a desire for her. Uh, he would write these magnificent love letters saying how much he, uh, he, he wanted Josephine, how much he wanted to go down on uh, what he called her little black forest. Um, he also called her sexual parts the Baron de Keppen. We don't know who the Baron de Keppen was, unfortunately, um, but uh, if anybody has any idea who he was, it would be very useful to know. Um, they, uh, uh, she did something called zigzags on him, and we still also don't know what the sexual position the zigzag was either. Again, anybody who's got any insight into this would be fascinating <laughs> to hear from them. Um, but, um, but whatever it was, she was uh, she did encapsulate um, him, and yet um, she felt virtually nothing for him. Within days of their marriage, in March 1796, uh, she, what, he, was, um, he went and had to go off to fight the Italian campaign, one of his series of greatest victories, um, and Josephine instead went to bed with somebody who one of their contemporaries said uh, had all the charm of a wig maker's assistant. <laughs> um, he, uh, uh, crushing for Napoleon, he found out about it when he was in Cairo on the Egyptian campaign uh, three years later. He was told about it and he started, um, and that was when he, he, uh, he was emotionally crushed by this, and this was when he started off on the first of his 22 love affairs with a beautiful, uh, uh, tall, 31-year-old blonde called uh, Pauline Fourbet. And the whole of, um, of Napoleon's life is like this. The more you look into it, the more you realise that no, he didn't put his hand inside his, his uh, waistcoat pocket in order to scratch his scabies. Um, no, he wasn't a, uh, a uh, midget. No, he was, in fact, uh, a, uh, a giant. And one sees that, not a moral giant rather than a, uh, another figure. He was a 
Uh, he was neither was he this warmonger, although he did commit a war crime, a terrible war crime in Jaffa in 1799, where he, he had 3,000 Turkish artillerymen shot on the beach um, after he had captured them six weeks before, and they had given their promise not to, uh, to bear arms against the French Republic. Six weeks later, he called them bearing arms against the uh, French Republic. It's obviously a war crime, even if it wasn't against the rules of law, um, or, of course, in the, in the Middle East from, uh, from uh, later periods as well. Nonetheless, it was something that, uh, that uh, he clearly shouldn't have done. There are, he is a, he's a fascinating, complicated, uh, morally disreputable at times, but overall great man, and somebody who the, uh, the British people uh, have never really truly uh, appreciated. And so I'd like to conclude um, just on the remarks of a young midshipman called George Hume, who was on the HMS Bellerophon, the Royal Naval Vessel, a, a frigate to which Napoleon surrendered on the 18th of July, 1815, a month after the Battle of, uh, of Waterloo. And he wrote in his diary that, um, that uh, Napoleon, of Napoleon, he said how uh, it was, um, extraordinary how one uh, small creature like ourselves can uh, achieve so much in a span so short. And I think that, ladies and gentlemen, is a much more interesting, much more uh, realistic, much more correct way to look at him than some um, mere uh, proto-Hitler or Tim Pop dictator. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
uh, only 129 years later, uh, and did tremendously well at the beginning. Uh, on the, uh, he captured three and a half million um, Russians in the course of the first few weeks of that campaign. On the first day of Operation Barbarossa, uh, which was the biggest invasion in human history, over three million Germans in 160 uh, divisions attacked. And on the first day, um, some 40% of the Russian air force was destroyed on the ground. And its commander, Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Ivan Kopetz, uh, shot himself uh, that afternoon, um, which in Stalin's Russia was a sensible career move. <laughs> uh, and yet, when, um, uh, when Hitler decided to send part of his Sixth Army group south to capture uh, Kiev and uh, go into the Ukraine, instead of punching on to take Moscow, uh, he was stopped. Yeah, on, the, uh, on the underground stations of, uh, of Moscow in, uh, in October uh, 1941. And it got so close that Stalin actually had his personal train made ready in Moscow um, railway station to take him beyond the Urals if the uh, Germans had got any closer. So it was totally touch and go. Of course, that would have been disastrous for Russian morale. Um, but Whereas Hitler never captured uh, Moscow, even in an, area, uh, in a, in an era of motorized, mechanized transport, um, Napoleon did succeed in doing it, uh, in an era where everything had to be uh, pulled by horses. So in a sense, he was much more successful, even though he didn't, of course, have the precedent to look out for in the way that Hitler did. And whilst uh, the Tin Button story isn't true, many, many men of Hitler's army did um, freeze to death, especially, of course, in the siege of Stalingrad in uh, late 1942 and early 1943. There was a moment, a terrible moment, in a marvellous book called uh, Caput by the Italian journalist uh, Curzio Malaparte. And what he recalled was being at the Europeische um, Cafe in Warsaw, which is still there, you can go there today, and seeing the men coming off, the German wounded coming off the trains, um, from the railway station across the, um, uh, across the uh, square and realising that many of them had no eyelids. Um, and he explains how when you get to these, uh, to these freezing sub-zero uh, temperatures um, and you're not given enough proper um, warm clothing, which is what, uh, what, what Hitler failed to provide for his um, men, um, first of all, your fingers and your ears and your nose and your sexual organs fall off, they just freeze off, and then you lose your eyelids, it falls off like a piece of dead skin, and the future is only losing. Well, it must have been a very close camera to see eyelids so close by, I mean, well, <laughs> actually, at the, at the station, <laughs> because I want to make sure that the research is correct. Thank you. That's very sweet of you, David. Yes. Uh, well, unfortunately, when I went there, I, I didn't see anybody there. Um, but uh, I don't know if they had been, if they had been uh, uh, any uh, man. No, I can't see what you want my hands on. Anyway, look, listen, I don't want to hog the uh, question. That anyway, there's no sense more of a riveting question for the professor. Yes. I can ask the professor. I enjoyed your comments very much. And I'd just like to ask you about something completely contemporary. Is, I'd be interested to know, you've written a lot about the European Union in its current format. What do you think Napoleon would have made of the, the current European Union? Do you think he would have been likely to advise um, British citizens to vote to stay in the European <laughs> Union? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, that's a very good, uh, very good question, I need to say. Um, well, he later, on St. Helena, when he was writing his autobiography, he also claimed that to be the, the father of the concept of the European Union, in that uh, he said he was fighting in order to create European civilization in such a way that it could protect itself from the Russians uh, on one side and the materialist Britons on the, on the other. And what he also tried to do was to create a, one of the things that brought him down, that actually impelled him first to attack in the peninsula at this terrible uh, opportunistic uh, war in the peninsula, and then also against Russia in 1812, which cost him half a million men out of the 615,000 who attacked, uh, was to try and create what was called the Continental System, which was a protectionist blockade, um, and uh, to force Britain back to the negotiating table. And so, um, 
many people in Britain decided that they wanted to ensure that their um, ability to trade with Europe uh, was, as far as they were concerned, more important than sovereignty of their country, that they would actually bow to uh, Napoleon and um, try to, uh, to uh, continue their, their existing trading relations with, uh, with Europe. Um, and, uh, and make peace with Napoleon under any uh, circumstances. And for them, trade was much more important uh, than anything to do with politics or sovereignty. Then there was also a small group of uh, Tories um, in, the, in the Liverpool government uh, who actually thought the exact opposite, who thought that it's only by retaining your sovereignty that you would be able to stop tyrants like, um, uh, like uh, Napoleon or people who wanted to create a massive protectionist bloc like the European um, Union. I, I, I'm not trying to draw any modern parallels, uh, of course, but um, anybody who didn't pick them up, I'd like to say it one more time. <laughs> uh, that, this, uh, that this small patriotic group of Tories actually saved the nation. David. You said that you, um, you said that in your research you had to simply, having been six days of Arger, family, six days, um, you held all the pub quizzes. Thank you, it's very sweet. You helped. You also won all the dead boys' games on the boat. You know that's what's, not true. What's your memory? <laughs> now, how would you describe to us um, what St Helena is like? How would you describe it? Can I, can I point out that as well as spending these six days um, with uh, David going there and, and several days also going back on the, on the boat, um, because of the, and this boat was a, was a um, Royal Naval, sorry, a, a Royal Mail packet um, steamer, and it was a, a pretty basic, uh, very basic thing, um, in which for some reason the plasma at every single meal meant that you had to sit next to the same people. In my case, uh, on my left, you'll remember David, uh, it was a Swiss railway engineer. Um, I, uh, I got to the uh, absolute extent of my knowledge and interest in uh, Swiss railways um, after the first course on the first day, and the uh, rest of the, of the week was, uh, was, was pretty uh, was social help, wasn't it? Uh, you remember that. Um, but my, my, my overwhelming memory of, um, of St. Helena, apart from this wonderful building, uh, Longwood House, which um, was where Napoleon lived and died for five and a half years he lived on that uh, island, which was, luckily not on the day we were filming, but uh, for 300 days of the year it is actually covered with cloud. Um, and so they all had, Napoleon and all his entourage had catarrh and bronchitis and flu and we just felt uh, sick all the time. Uh, the wallpaper peeled off the walls constantly. And in order to play cards, they had to put the deck of cards into the oven um, every, uh, every evening in order to dry out the cards because they got so uh, sticky and would stick with one another. This was how unhealthy this place was that uh, we sent uh, Napoleon off to, uh, to stay in. But my main memory of it was how strange it was that, um, well, first of all, there are 3,000 people who live on that island, a thousand of which have never left the island. It's an island eight miles by, 12, by 10 miles uh, in the middle of the Atlantic uh, Ocean. It's the second most re remote uh, inhabited island in the world. And um, they have, needless to say, uh, an appalling problem with uh, regard to uh, child sex abuse. Uh, I said to the governor, you know, this is, this is monstrous, this uh, uh, way in which you, 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 know, you have quite so many paedophiles on this island. And he said, well, we're not so bad as Tristan de Canoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my number one uh, memory of this place was how strange it was as far as the vegetation was concerned. Half of it was a jungle, and the other half was a sort of windswept, flat moonscape. It was, uh, it was a very, very strange place, and not really, I mean, poor old, you did feel sorry for Napoleon pretty much the minute you got there, and we only spent 48 hours there to do filming. What it must have been like to have lived there for five and a half years is anyone's guess. Thank you for coming with me. We went to 10 countries um, in the course of filming this, uh, uh, this uh, three-part uh, BBC TV series that's uh, on YouTube. Now, why didn't we, we shoot Napoleon? We didn't shoot him because um, we were British. Uh, the uh, Prussians wanted to shoot him, the Bourbons wanted to shoot him, uh, the Austrians didn't because he was uh, the Emperor's um, son-in-law. 
but, um, but if it had been if it had fallen into the hands of, uh, of uh, pretty much anybody else fighting those wars, certainly the Neapolitans who shot Marshal Murat, probably the Russians, uh, they would have, uh, they'd have just done that. But because he was an anointed king, uh, it was considered um, pretty bad form for the, for the British to uh, shoot him, and so as a result, that's why he decided to surrender to us. He had the most weird idea that we were going to actually, uh, and this was after he'd escaped from Elba and to, to fought, the, fought the entire 100 days campaign, he thought that we were going to put him up in a nice country house in the home counties. Uh, and to maybe give him a little pied a terre in London as well. Um, and, um, and he thought that that was what was going to happen to him. It was the most extraordinary um, sort of disconnect from, from reality at that stage. Excuse my ignorance, who, who actually, what was the body of who decided St. Helens? Um, the British cabinet. It was the, cabinet. Uh, it, the, the individuals responsible were Lord Castlereagh, the Foreign Secretary, who asked the Duke of Wellington, um, who was then ambassador in Paris, I think. Um, what St. Helena was actually like, and uh, because he was the only person in the cabinet who'd ever been there. He stopped there for a couple of weeks on the way back from India in 1805, when he'd been fighting the Maratha Wars. And he um, said that actually St. Helena was an extremely nice place and uh, had a uh, had rather uh, lovely uh, climate, which it did for the two weeks that uh, Wellington was there in the summer. It was just the, uh, the, the other uh, 50 weeks a year. <laughs> it was, uh, it was in, under cloud cover. Do, do we know um, what the vote was? Was it unanimous in the cabinet? Well, it was decided between Lord Liverpool, the Prime Minister, uh, Lord Hawkesbury, the um, Secretary of War, uh, Duke of Wellington, and, uh, and um, Castlereagh. So the four most important people in the cabinet put it forward to the rest of the cabinet, and so it was, uh, it was a, a unanimous. Yeah. Did um, Napoleon hate? He, well, he hated St. Helena, uh, and understandably so, but he uh, had this weird love-hate relationship with the British, actually. Uh, on many, many occasions, he praised uh, the British. He praised their constitution, he praised, uh, he was extremely nice to British prisoners of war in the Waterloo campaign. When he saw a, a, a wounded British officer, he would stop and, and give his own um, water to him and, uh, and this kind of thing. But um, overall, he understood that the British were an essential part of his nemesis, especially after our victory at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, which meant that Britain was no longer invadable. He realized that the only way to, or at least he believed that the only way to bring the British to the negotiating table was through this disastrous um, continental system. So, first, first of all, I have to ask that question. I'm five foot six. Well, there we are. <laughs> no, more seriously, as a historian, you know. What's unserious about that five or six? As a historian, <laughs> as a historian that 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 looks backwards and forwards, uh, two sort of questions Putin, Putin's Russia, where's he going? Yeah. Um, and do you ever, I mean, I'm, when you were born, I'm a little bit old with you, the, the, the Second World War seemed a long time ago to people today. We were born just after the Second World War, relatively speaking. Do you ever have sleepless nights of what may eventually happen to us? Um, I mean, the, the means of destruction is so huge these days, potentially. So there's two, there's two questions. Right. Which is right? Should we, should we, I mean, I don't intend to do this. I was, I was born 18 years after the end of the Second World War. And uh, so for me, when growing up, the Second World War was, was everything. People were constantly talking about it. I met loads of people who'd, uh, who'd uh, fought in it. My first few books were about the Second World War, so I interviewed lots of people who knew Winston Churchill and, uh, and fought in quite senior positions, including generals in the Second World War. So um, yes, it has been a, a, a fascination for me. Um, with regard to the, um, and no, I'm not kept awake. Um, uh, I wasn't even kept awake when we had the Cold War and the you know, Russians had enough nuclear devices uh, um, uh, aimed at us to uh, destroy the um, uh, United Kingdom in a, in a blip. Um, but um, with regard to Mr. Putin, who is so often, who, who, 
who considers himself to be a modern czar, who um, who acts in that way, who does uh, who's, who's interested in history. As my great friend Simon Seabag Montefiore, who knows a lot of the people in the entourage of uh, President Putin, points out, um, he is uh, he's very interested in the czarist history of uh, of Russia because he considers himself to be the the modern czar. But the point about um, a czar, uh, czar Putin is that he is nothing like so um, so impressive and powerful as and knows it as uh, previous czars. The classic example, of course, being, I hope you've all been watching the War and Peace uh, on, uh, on BBC, uh, the great Tsar Alexander I. And even Stalin realised that he wasn't as great a, a great a man as Alexander I and came out with a marvellous um, uh, statement at the Battle of, um, uh, sorry, at the Conference of Potsdam in July 1945. Just before that uh, conference, he went to visit the, um, the grave of Frederick the Great at Saint Cécile, and uh, which had to be moved because of bombing and all the rest of it. But they they they, they worked out where he was uh, buried. And um, one of uh, Stalin's oleaginous uh, entourage said, "Look, Great Hajj, uh, you have come this far. You have uh, you have brought Russian armies, you know, deep into the heart of Germany as far as the uh, as the burial place of." Frederick II, and Stalin just shrugged and he said, Alexander got to Paris. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the most interesting talk. Uh, an observation rather than a question. One can't help noticing over this uh, the whole field that uh, Napoleon is barely French. Hitler is barely German. Stalin is barely Russian, and these are the great names of that whole period. That's right, and I think you can extend that also to Tamerlane and Genghis. Uh, they also came from um, from areas adjacent to the great uh, empires that they uh, that they ruled over and uh, and started off on, on great wars of uh, conquest. Um, but I, I, I think um, it's, it's a fairly well-known um, psychological thing, isn't it, displacement, where you uh, attempt to be more French than the French, for example. Napoleon um, was, he came from an upper-middle-class family in, uh, in Corsica. Uh, he was, um, Corsica became French the year before he was born. He had a very strange relationship with France and, and Frenchness. He um, hated uh, the French up until about the, the 20th year of his life, by which time his father had died. And then with the French Revolution, he started to, uh, to identify with, uh, with France. Of course, he'd been educated entirely in France at French schools from the age of nine uh, onwards. Didn't come home until he, for the first seven years of his life, and see his mother for six years of them. Um, he, you know, it was a, uh, a uh, discombobulating uh, form of education, and then when he started to uh, to identify with uh, with France, he overcompensated for it effectively, and uh, and uh, you see that also with the Austrian Hitler and the Georgian um, Stalin. So I think it's quite a well known. Um, uh, Psychological thing, and by the way, you can't just stop stop there. Of course, uh, you know, um, uh, King George the uh, who was in charge of, uh, who was king of England at the same time, was uh, was pretty German, and uh, he went out of his way to identify with the British as well. So it's not just necessarily something that uh, dictators do. Yeah, but he was a man. <laughs> <laughs> Not all the time. And he was also much less mad than, uh, than he's made out to be more mad. Sorry. Uh, I mean, all well, this is from hindsight. Do you say, what, what's your thoughts on the fact that uh, a man of such an ambition and achieved so much would have come unstuck, or was that not in the end? What was that not a for What if he hadn't invaded Russia? No, I don't see that at all, actually. I, I think that uh, if he'd either, I mean, after the Battle of Maliera Starbits, if he had um, uh, continued on south, where he thought the Russian army was, but in fact the Russian army had stepped back off the uh, road and had left the road to Kaluga completely free. So had he avoided the retreat from Moscow and the, and the horrors that happened at, uh, at uh, Berezina and Krasnoy and other battlefields, um, and kept his army together, he could well have retreated back into, um, into 
uh, France with an unbroken army, which then would have um, meant that the Austrians and the Prussians wouldn't have risen up against him. Uh, remember, he did have cancer. He was going to die in May 1821, and so, which was only nine years after the, uh, the battle, uh, sorry, the, the campaign. And then he would have uh, passed on his crown to Napoleon II, his, uh, his infant son, and the uh, Queen Regent, the Empress Regent, Mary Louise. Um, there were lots of incredibly talented um, cambassares and other incredibly talented uh, politicians who could have kept um, France as a, uh, as a reforming uh, constitutional monarchy. And uh, who's to say you might not have had the, um, or you certainly would have had the Bourbons back in power, you wouldn't have had the 1830 and 1848 revolutions. That's one of the great what ifs, you know. That's why I love what ifs. I won't say anything about the what ifs. I mean, one of the great theories of the book is that uh, he was the man who really brought the idea of meritocracy uh, rather than um, birth um, and, and spread the gospel that you know you can, in fact, achieve all those things being an ordinary um, a person as he was. And yet, when he became emperor. He was going to crown his son king, the next emperor. So, is there a contradiction between the bravado about meritocracy, um, and yet he would then go along the bloodline, like the eternal argument between the Sunnis and the Shiites over the country? Yes, there's, there's an in classic internal contradiction that you've uh, put your finger on there, David. Uh, he did believe in meritocracy. Of the 26 marshals of the French Empire, Napoleon, um, Napoleon appointed 26 marshals, and hitherto all the marshals of France for the last thousand years have, have come from the upper classes. And uh, he appointed uh, 12 of them, almost half, from the um, uh, they were the sons of barrel coopers and innkeepers and bailiffs and, and indoor peasants, indoor servants and outdoor peasants and people who had never before uh, held these, these kind of uh, ranks. And what it did, of course, he made two of them kings. Bernadotte became king of Sweden and uh, Murat became king of uh, Naples. And um, never before had these, uh, and actually with Bernadotte, when he became king of Sweden, he was a little bit embarrassed that uh, when he was a sergeant, he had had the words, death to kings, tattooed on his uh, chest. <laughs> but, uh, but this, um, uh, this um, actually you could add a 13th marshal, Sururier, because although he claimed that his father had had a military, uh, sorry, had had a royal appointment, when you look into it, in fact, he was the royal mole catcher. Uh, so, uh, so that doesn't make him uh, uh, anything other than the 13th um, person, so half of the marshals who came from, uh, from relatively lowly backgrounds. And yet, in 1808, he created the, recreated the system of having viscounts and earls and barons and uh, these uh, uh, marquises and dukes and princes. Um, and the reason was not because he had uh, turned his back on meritocracy, because you, in order to become a peer, um, and they, he only had life peers, your son didn't automatically um, become a peer unless he had proved service to the state as well. Um, he actually, you, you became a peer through merit. And so it was a, uh, it was a form of, um, of um, uh, soit distant um, meritocracy. But you were right also that, of course, he made his, first of all, his brother um, would, have, uh, would have become an emperor after him, his brother Joseph. And then when, um, when the um, uh, little prince was born, then the Aiglon, uh, Napoleon II, would have become emperor. And that flies in the face entirely um, against the, the Republican meritocratic system. That is why um, Beethoven scratched out um, Napoleon's name from the uh, title page of the Eroica. Symphony, for example, and it's why uh, various high-minded people like Benjamin Constant left the, uh, the um, uh, French government. So, um, if you ever had to invade this country, uh, what would a Napoleonic Britain look like? <laughs> I think if you invaded this country, a Napoleonic Britain would have looked an awful lot, like, much more like um, Northern Italy looked after he successfully imposed um, um, imposed his, uh, his will on that country. So 
he um, would have reformed the, uh, the uh, taxation system, uh, the, he'd, have been, he'd have tried to have brought over the Whig oligarchy, the Whig aristocracy, uh, to support him, probably with some success, considering how much many of the Whigs uh, did support Napoleon during the short period of peace, the Peace of Amiens in 1802 and 1803. Um, you know, our assumption would be, and of course a lot depends on how much we'd have fought back, if, the, if it had been like the Home Guard, uh, you know, dying in, in, in every ditch, which I hope is an Englishman, it would have been like that. But um, if it hadn't been, and uh, there had been some kind of accommodation, and London had fallen early to an army of 100,000 uh, fully armed um, veterans, uh, then you wouldn't necessarily have got uh, the um, guillotines in St. James's Park, which is, of course, what uh, men like Thomas Rowlandson and James Gilray were, uh, were predicting in their cartoons. Byron. Need the, um... Given how much uh, Byron admired Napoleon and made that operation so public, <laughs> given how much Byron admired Napoleon made that operation so public, I wonder um, whether Napoleon ever read any of Byron's poetry and what you might have thought of Byron. He loved Byron, yeah. He read Charles Harold a lot. He took, um, he took Byron's poetry on, in his carriage uh, onto uh, all of his campaigns. Um, and uh, he saw Byron quite rightly as the kind of radical who would have um, would have uh, appre did appreciate and love um, and love the poem. When Byron visited Hougamont uh, farmhouse, he wrote uh, his name in the um, uh, in um, the tree there. He actually put his name in the tree, uh, and uh, he wrote coruscatingly vicious uh, attacks on Wellington and Castlereagh. Of course, he uh, was, he had his own carriage made as an exact replica of Napoleon's carriage when he went off to, to Europe. And he wasn't alone. There were lots of those, uh, of those uh, radical uh, poets who, um, who saw Britain as being a uh, corrupt oligarchy and believed that Napoleon would have um, brought a, a breath of uh, fresh air. Now, I don't believe that at all. I think the, the idea of Having foreign troops uh, on one's soil is uh, is something that every Englishman's gorge should rise at. Um, but um, ultimately, when you look, and so, so as a result, ultimately, when you look at the at the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, when uh, the Treaty of Vienna was signed, uh, we asked for absolutely no territorial um, gains in uh, in um, European in, in Europe itself. Uh, even though we had fought for 22 years, pretty much non-stop against Napoleon, far more than any of the other countries, um, including Austria. Um, but we did get the noble points of the uh, British Empire, places like, uh, like Cape Colony and uh, places in India and, uh, and Heligoland and various other spots from which we built the, um, the, the, the largest empire the world's ever seen. So the story has a happy ending. They didn't read by any Sorry? They didn't read Byron in English. No, it was translated almost immediately. The Don Juan cantos were, uh, were translated in the same year as they were published. During the Second World War, was there any war activity during the uh, in the South America? Uh, a little, yes. Um, it, there was the Grafsch Bay, of course, in um, Montevideo, that was sunk in, um, in the. Uh, Harbour just outside Montevideo, but otherwise um, you didn't get a lot. The Brazil, I think, entered the war on the Allied side in kind of March 1945 in order to get uh, invited onto the um, onto the peace um, negotiations. But uh, apart from naval fighting, there was uh, nothing that needed to be uh, done because uh, the Nazis and uh, Japanese didn't pose a threat to uh, to America from the uh, the south. But a lot of Nazis went to Brazil and Argentina. Yes, yes, it was a place to, uh, to escape. Uh, to the rich ones went there, the, the, the poor went to Namib Namibia. I went to, um, in fact, in Namibia now, there is a, a street called, in Winter, called Goeringstrasse, um, which uh, is actually named after Goering's farmer, nonetheless. It's quite a surprise when you see it in Gothic uh, uh, script like that. In fact, all the cafes have got uh, German. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I once interviewed um, von Ribbentrop, Joachim von Ribbentrop, the uh, Nazi uh, foreign minister's private secretary, and uh, I said to him, um, 
I said to him, what, how did you, what did you do after the war? And he said, well, between 1945 and 1955, I lived in Argentina. And I said, okay, um, whereabouts? He said, oh, a little town. Um, we were on one side of the town, and there was um, a sort of gorge, and then there was a bridge. And on the other side um, of the gorge were all the um, people who had uh, turned up to this uh, town up to 1938, <coughs> basically Jews who'd escaped from Germany. And he said, uh, yeah, not many people cross the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Reinhard von Spitzi, his name was. You don't, you don't get a much more Nazi name than that. <laughs> Um, the, 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 your French. Yeah, your French. Right, right, right. Yes. Well, but first of all, the good news is, madam, that they don't hate them. The, the left do. Uh, the people who see him as a racist, sexist, and uh, imperialist, you know, conquering monster do. But actually, that is not by no means the majority of the French people. Uh, when one thinks about Dominique de Villepin's books about uh, Napoleon, I once interviewed. Um, I had a drink with uh, Nicholas Sarkozy, who admires um, Napoleon. Um, he's not uh, he's not as uh, as uh, unpopular amongst all people. It's a very much it's a political divide. Uh, that's a disaster. And also, um, I noticed in the anniversary, uh, the, the bicentenary of the Battle of Austerlitz, uh, the French didn't even send a minister, even a junior minister, and they gave no money whatsoever for the celebrations. Uh, so actually what you had to what they had was um, British people dressing up as, <laughs> <laughs> as Frenchmen, including the Emperor himself. Uh, that's right, yeah. So you had British people who were dressed up as, as, as Britons and the British people dressing up as French uh, to, to commemorate Napoleon's greatest victory. Explain that to me. <laughs> Exactly. But isn't it because, I found I'm very sorry, but isn't it because I mean, the whole basis of, of, of modern France after the French Revolution, which, I mean, you were the author of Henri Chouazement, and, uh, and, and yet Napoleon was seen as, as being somebody who, who wanted to bring back the empire. So in, in, in trying to introduce the bourgeoisie, the middle class, uh, in a republic, uh, they obviously hated his return and nearly turned that republic back into, um, into empire. Well, he did. I mean, his nephew, of course, did. Uh, Napoleon III, who came to power in 1851 and uh, then became emperor in 1852, um, ruled for 18 years until the, until the Fourth uh, uh, Republic um, overthrew him in 1870. So that's, um, uh, that is another reason why, uh, why some uh, on, the, on the French left uh, despise uh, Napoleon, but I don't think that's 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 universally true at all. Of uh, and certainly when we uh, we did a lot of uh, filming in in uh, France, didn't we, David? We never came across anybody who didn't uh, like Napoleon. He was uh, he was considered a national hero in much the same way uh, that uh, the Winston Churchill is today, mind you. And De Gaulle, of course. You also have De Gaulle, who has a very had a very strange love hate relationship with Napoleon. He, he, uh, he admired him as the uh, as the uh, great leader of the country and as the reformer and radical and uh, and uh, thinker and so on, but uh, despised him for, for having ultimately lost. He was married to two women who didn't like him, and, and uh, well, Mary Louise actually and he had a, a good strong relationship at the beginning, but um, she went off she and was unfaithful to him before before he went back to his uh, extremely sexy um, uh, blonde mistress, uh, Mary Valeska, uh, by whom he had uh, one of his illegitimate uh, children. Sorry, I was just saying, that was Martinique. Don't French have an issue with Martinique and what happened in Martinique? Um, well, Martinique is still part of the of the French. It's a it's a um, département of, uh, of France, and of course that's where Josephine grew up as well. The reason that she had such bad teeth was because she chewed on the cane sugar uh, as a child in, uh, in Martinique. I have a question for you, actually. What is your next project in pipeline, if you have one? And also, are you doing a tennis stage in your life? Uh, um, um, I'm writing at the moment a single volume, uh, Cradle to the Grave Life of Winston Churchill. 
Um, I, I have actually written a little book about the royal family called The Royal House of Windsor. It's a, uh, um, it sells well on Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yes, all right. Um, Boris Johnson, well, you could call it a book, yes. Um, it, uh, it's not what I would call a history book, though. Um, it's, uh, or indeed, I, I wouldn't wholly call it a biography either. It's a, um, it's a lot of lovely, very, very funny stories that were told to him at White's Club by uh, his friend Nicholas Soames. Um, and which he has uh, taken entirely um, truthfully and uh, stuck around as though, as though all these stories were true. I went to one of his speeches, Boris's speeches, a friend of mine, and I, and I love him dearly, but uh, I went to one of his speeches in New York in which he told 10 um, Churchill anecdotes, uh, of which one was true. <laughs> so the only difference between my book and his is that I'm going to have true stories. It's the way it ends. By the way, I wouldn't, I'd be very happy if I got 10% of his sales. <laughs> um, all right, anybody else? One last question. A really erudite, difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did you think of War and Peace? Did I loved it, it. I loved it. Did you did it very well? Yes, I, 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 yeah, I really loved it. I'm not just saying that because this is um, being taped and the man who made uh, War and Peace um, Harvey Weinstein has also optioned my book for a TV series on, uh, on Napoleon, uh, Napoleon Josephine it's going to be called, and so uh, any uh, even minor criticism would be a suicidally stupid thing. But I don't want to anyway, because I thought that the depiction of, I mean the, the only sad thing about it was that it was only six episodes long, and to try to shoehorn a thousand page book into six uh, ep hour long episodes is, is not, not impossible. But if he, uh, so if he'd had the full 13 episodes, which I bet he wished he had, considering how successful the uh, show was, um, he'd have been able to have gone into it in more depth. But nonetheless, the battle scenes were wonderful. Uh, she was great. Uh, you know, uh, my uh, wife tells me that uh, Andre was staggeringly handsome and uh, attractive. Uh, Pierre, I wasn't so, I wasn't so taken with uh, Napoleon himself, a um, bit too thin, actually. Um, but he was, he was pretty big guy uh, by 1812. But, um, but any mistakes, uh, you know, War and Peace can't be seen as a serious historical. Um, uh, Tolstoy hated Napoleon, so as Tolstoy uh, had weird uh, determinist views as well, which he uh, covers in a sort of 90 page aside um, about how uh, the French would have invaded Russia even without Napoleon, which is complete, uh, completely absurd. And so the drawbacks with the movie War and Peace. Uh, sorry, the TV series War and Peace are the faults of Leo Tolstoy, not of Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies like and gentlemen, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>